Welcome back everybody to the second half of the lecture where we continue on with more tales of the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. This <clears throat> this diagram here is showing part of the route of Robert Falcon Scott during his attempt to reach the South Pole. And his attempt to reach the South Pole was part of what was known as the race to the South Pole, because two separate people would attempt to be the first leader to lead a group of people to the South Pole during the same year. And the race to the South Pole is one of the central and most legendary trips of the heroic age. And contrary to popular belief, Mr. Amundsen and Mr. Scott do not appear to have had any real anger or animosity towards each other. But they were both, by this point, famous explorers. Amundsen, I mentioned briefly during the first half of the lecture, he had served as first mate aboard the Belgian Antarctic Expedition. He was Norwegian, and he was an experienced mountaineer who had also successfully traversed the Canadian archipelago from Baffin Island, excuse me, from Baffin Bay in Canada to Nome, Alaska. And thus, he had found a difficult but navigable Northwest Passage. Mr. Amundsen began his route on the eastern side of the Ross Shelf at the Bay of Wales, and he would indeed become the first person to reach the South Pole. Robert Falcon Scott was making his second attempt to reach the South Pole, and this time his trip was entirely geared towards that goal. He began his route on Ross Island, and he followed more or less the same route that Shackleton had taken in his almost successful attempt to reach the South Pole several years before. And both Scott and Amundsen would reach the South Pole, but Scott got there about a month after Amundsen did. And when he reached the South Pole, his crew was in significantly worse shape. And Amundsen and, some of, and all of his men would make it back safely, but tragically not one member of Scott's crew would survive. And that included Robert Falcon Scott himself. Scott and his last surviving men died in March of 1912 while they were on the Ross ice shelf relatively close to their return point. Now, Scott didn't bear Amundsen any personal animosity, but he did feel like his thunder was being stolen. And when Amundsen made his attempt, Amundsen was kind of compensating for the fact that he had really been more interested in reaching the North Pole but he was beaten to it by an expedition led by Robert Peary and the first person to reach the North Pole himself, Matthew Hansen, as someone I'll touch on a bit later. So Roald Amundsen almost visited Antarctica as an afterthought, but nonetheless, his strategy would turn out to be the more successful one. Ponies had not fared well, but he had a lot of experience with sled dogs and he would end up having a lot more success with using sled dogs to quickly and effectively reach the South Pole. He had used dogs during his time as an Arctic guide. He viewed them as being faster and more effective than ponies and cars, and he would, of course, actually plan to eat a number of them as part of the preparations. Um, Twelve, excuse me, eleven of the dogs would survive the journey, and they would return to Australia with him and be honored for their effort. Um, so a fair bit of some definitely some animal welfare concerns with this also, but the sled dogs helped him and his men reach the South Pole. That's regardless. And they generally served them well. Only three men besides himself actually went to the South Pole, and it was meant to be a very lightly burdened expedition. He had many more men remaining on the ship, and these men made short trips to stash food for Amundsen and his men to eat on their return visit. Amundsen himself had come to Antarctica early, a year ahead of time, and he used the winter to make warm clothes, to modify the sleds to make them as light and swift as possible, and undertaking a number of survey trips to make maps and to stash food. So with the dogs doing most of the manual labor, Amundsen and his men made good time to the pole, and they arrived on December 14th, 1911. They established a camp that they named Polheim, which means pole home, and they remained there for three days. They left behind a tent to prove that they indeed had been the first people to reach the South Pole. And they also left it there as relief for Scott in case he needed it, which it turned out he did. They also left food for Scott, which he would also badly need, it turned out. 
And you can see we do have a couple of pictures from Amundsen's visit. We have the Norwegian flag, and you can see the sled dogs in just about every picture he took. Now, Robert Falcon Scott would be less fortunate, unfortunately. Much of what is known about his trip is from his journal, and his journal was recovered in good condition at his final camp after his death. He attempted an all of the above strategy. Amundsen just tried to travel as lightly as possible and as quickly, and Scott used ponies and horses and cars and also brought as many supplies as possible. He went bringing just thinking, let's bring just whatever, just in case. And he, like Amundsen, arrived a year ahead of time and he set supplies on his route. And that route was fairly well mapped because Shackleton had gone over much of it before. He began with 15 men and 11 of those men returned along the way. Scott himself, along with um, his four men, reached the pole on January 17th, one month after Amundsen had left. And although the tent and the food that Amundsen had left behind helped them a fair bit, they had a very difficult time on the way home. The men were suffering from frostbite, which is when your nose or your fingers or toes start to get frozen. And you don't want to get frostbite. That can lead to amputations. So it did not help that with the ponies having died and the cars having broken down and that not really, them not really having taken much of that to the pole itself, the return journey was almost entirely on foot, which made it a lot harder for them. The first man to pass was Mr. Edgar Evans, who collapsed on February 17th, and Lawrence Oates, who suffered from frostbite, appears to have sacrificed himself to save the others and make sure that they had enough food. But Scott, Wilson, and Bowers would nonetheless probably have had no chance of survival either way, and they the last journal entry from Scott's journal is on March 29th. This was after they got stuck in a blizzard on March 20th. Tragically and depressingly less than 11 miles from their main supply depot where they had food waiting for them. They just couldn't get anywhere because the weather was so bad. And that's one reason why even to this day travel in Antarctica can be quite dangerous because if you can't see anything, you can get stranded really just in the middle of nowhere. His final entry would be written on March 29th, and that is presumed to be the day in which he and the others died. In his own words, outside the door of the tent, it remains a scene of whirling drift. So the whiteout in which he and his men just couldn't see anything was going on, and they had no hope of moving forward. So it underscored the fact that traveling in Antarctica was dangerous business, and these expeditions should not be taken carelessly. <clears throat> The next expedition I want to talk about a little bit is the Australian Antarctic Expedition, which began in 1911, and it was helmed by Douglas Mawson, who had previously gone to Antarctica with Shackleton on the Nimrod Expedition, when he had been one of the men to skate to sled down Mount Erebus. And for his own expedition, his plans were ambitious. He hoped to land in a position where he would be able to track to the South Magnetic Pole. And he hoped to create three separate Antarctic bases and create radio contact between Antarctica and Macquarie Island, which is an island between Antarctica and Australia. And the idea was that this would test whether a radio connection could be established between Antarctica and Australia and other inhabited lands going forward. So Mawson landed at Commonwealth Bay in East Antarctica, and he named it after the Commonwealth of Australia. And his ambitious plans were thwarted when he realized just how windy Cape Denison and Commonwealth Bay were. It is to this day considered to be one of the windiest spots in Antarctica, and they've recorded gusts of wind up to 200 miles an hour there. So he nonetheless, in spite of this setback, decided to try and head south. And his party of three ultimately got about 50 miles south of the South Magnetic Pole, or excuse me, 50 miles short of the South Magnetic Pole before the bad weather forced him to turn around. Of course, one of his men, Mr. Ninnis, also fell into a crevasse along with the dogs pulling his sled in their tents. So this disaster kind of put an end to any hopes to reach the pole and make more bases. Mawson and his Mert, and Mertz, who was his surviving crewmate, killed all of the remaining dogs to eat. And Mertz is believed to have died from 
eating nothing but dog livers and getting an overdose of vitamin D. So vitamins are good, but an overload of vitamins can be very bad for your health in some cases. Mawson himself continued on for another 100 miles, and he nearly died by falling into a crevasse, but he miraculously managed to escape. He arrived back at camp on February 1st, just in time to see his ship departing, since his men could no longer remain safely and get out of the ice. Luckily, they had left six men behind with the equipment to stay over the winter, and these six men discovered Mawson. The seven of them ended up spending the winter in Antarctica, and they survived and managed okay because they'd brought enough supplies, and they received a hero's welcome when they got back to Australia. But it definitely proved the danger of wandering too far into the interior of Antarctica. And if the snow-covered roof on the picture on the previous slide doesn't indicate enough to you, the winds in this picture just look awful. This is really how badly windy it can get in Antarctica. His crew also tried to fly a plane in Antarctica. They were the first to do that. They didn't have a lot of luck, but it was still important in attempting to attempting something that would later has become a mainstay of Antarctic transport. Now, plane flight in Antarctica is pretty commonplace, but, but it was quite scary and ambitious early on. So we don't have many more expeditions left. Another German expedition occurred, and this expedition was largely set up to determine if Antarctica was a single continent or multiple land masses. They also wanted to see if the Ross and Wood Elsies were connected. They wanted to establish a base. That did not happen. And although they did manage to find that Antarctica was a single landmass, they went back to South Georgia Island low. Excuse me, they went back to South Georgia Island early because their, their crew was kind of in a mess. There was a rumor that they would not be paid, and that caused the men to turn on Wilhelm Dulcher. Um, and meant that this expedition didn't really go anywhere. So it's one of the more forgotten expeditions of, this, of the heroic age. The next expedition is almost certainly the most famous, and it is Shackleton's expedition near the very end of the heroic age. And it is one of the most famous tales of survival. Um, and Shackleton, remember, had gone to Antarctica several times before. He had gone with Scott during his first expedition, and he had also gone to Antarctica aboard the Nimrod and had almost reached the South Pole. After almost reaching the South Pole, Scott and Amundsen managed to beat Shackleton to it. And so he still wanted to go back to Antarctica, and he now had to think of something more impressive and ambitious to do. So he set his sights on a new trip, and that was to do a sea to sea cross continental trek during which he would land in West Antarctica and then cross the entire continent and be picked up by another ship in the Ross Sea. So two ships went to Antarctica under his command, the Endurance and the Aurora, and Shackleton rode on the Endurance. They first sailed to South Georgia Island, which by this point was still inhabited by whalers and sealers, but the colonies were a bit more ragtag and a bit more impoverished because the seal and whale populations had really been, had really been wiped out a lot. And Shackleton's crew aboard the Endurance then headed south towards Vassal Bay. During their attempt to land, the Endurance became stuck in the ice. And they tried to free the Endurance from the ice by fire, by pickaxes, and by basically anything they could think of. But they eventually had to realize that the ship was just stuck in ice. About a month after the ship was trapped on February 24th, Shackleton gave up and he declared that the ship be converted to a station in which they would weather out the winter. And notice the map. The, the Endurance gets beset on January 18th, 1915. And you'll see that they abandoned the ship up here. And what that indicates is that the ice was moving. The ship was being carried along by the ice. And by the time they abandoned the ship, it had been carried quite a bit north by moving ice. And this did have a per this did sort of inadvertently help them in moving them north, moving them slightly more northward towards habitable lands, but it also took them way off their original goal. They wanted to land on the coast and the ice took them way far from their landing point. And the ice also damaged the structural integrity of the ship. So 
they ended up hundreds of miles from where they had intended to land, and they spent 281 days trapped in the ice with very little food, very little warmth, and almost nothing to keep them entertained. They didn't have a band. They apparently kept themselves entertained by dog races, doing improv theater of all things, and by going on strolls in the moonlight. Um, so they found ways to maintain their sanity. Just a little, just they didn't have a band. But anyhow, Shackleton, oops, pardon me. Shackleton realized on October 23rd of, of 18, excuse me, of 1915, that the pressure from the ice was destroying the ship. And he realized that the ship was beyond saving and that they were not going to get to Antarctica and that they had to just focus on getting out of Antarctica and surviving. So Shackleton ordered them, ordered his men to remove the lifeboats and take all provisions and the ship was abandoned on October 27th. So they were now hundreds of miles from the nearest land without a ship, only with a few lifeboats. And they were essentially on the ice sheet in the middle of nowhere. Shackleton now had to turn his focus to survival instead of any hope of reaching Antarctica. And he at first tried to march and they carried two of the lifeboats on sledges. You can see this in this picture, that's what they're doing. But the rough sea ice made it hard to do this very effectively. And so they decided to make camp and hope that once the ice broke up, they would be able to take the lifeboats through the ice and northward to some islands that had whaling colonies. Endurance finally sank on November 21st, 1915, and the crew became more dependent on sealmate for survival now that the last of the provisions from the Endurance were almost gone. Shackleton realized that they should send a small party in one of the lifeboats and try to make for an inhabited island, possibly Deception Island, the caldera where Nathaniel Palmer had built his whaling station, or to South Georgia. So on April, on April 9th, 1916, Shackleton and his men boarded lifeboats and made it to Elephant Island in the South Shetland Islands after five days, the first time any of them had been on land in 16 months. The day before this, on April 8th, the ice flow had started to split. Their camp was on a small triangular shaped piece of ice and Shackleton realized that if this piece broke up, they would be doomed. So that's why he decided to make a break for it then. So they made it to Elephant Island and there was nobody on Elephant Island. It was land, but it wasn't land that had people going near it and it wasn't really visited by whalers but it was at least a possible starting point for a voyage to one of the less remote islands. And it was a bit safer than just being on the ice. Shackleton decided to, he was originally going to try to go for Deception Island, but he decided that that was too far away. His crew were in really poor condition and he realized he would need to get them to safety sooner. He also thought about going to Stanley, which is now the capital of the Falkland Islands, but he realized he would have to sail against the prevailing winds. And so he decided to head towards a whaling station on South Georgia Island known as Stromness. And Shackleton and five of his crew took one of the lifeboats known as the James Caird and the rest of his men remained on Elephant Island. Their instructions were to make a last ditch attempt to go to Deception Island if Shackleton didn't come back within a certain amount of time. The crew that was left behind on Elephant Island survived by eating seaweed and cooking seal bones during the winter to get the marrow out of them. Nobody perished, but one person's toes had to be cut off. Frostbite is really bad because if it advances enough, you can end up having to amputate toes. And Shackleton's men had to do this by the light of a blubber stove, which sounds hellish, frankly. So over 14 days, Shackleton and his men would make their way to South Georgia Island. And you can see that it's not a trivial journey. Elephant Island is right off the coast of the Antarctic Peninsula, and it took them about two weeks in a boat to make it to South Georgia Island. They ended up after these 14 days, these 14 harrowing days in a lifeboat in the stormy Southern Ocean, they ended up on the wrong side of the island. So they then had to cross 17 miles worth of ice caps and scraggly mountains. And that doesn't sound like a lot compared to going 800 miles over the, over the ocean, but it's still kind of like, oh my God, we finally reached land and now we have to climb again. They, managed, they, they never became the first people to cross the Antarctic continent, but they did become the first people to cross South Georgia Island. So they did get a bit of the unexpected distinction there. Nobody would attempt to do that again until the 1950s because South Georgia Island has a lot of glaciers and it's very mountainous and rocky. 
But after two very rough days of hiking, Shackleton and his crew reached the whaling station, and they immediately told their story to the people and put together a search party that was sent to rescue the remaining men. They made several attempts to reach Elephant Island. They eventually were able to approach the island with the help of the Chilean Navy, and the men were rescued at long last on August 30th, 1916. All of them made it, but hilariously, nobody in the party had been aware that World War I had broken out. And it kind of reminds me of how little awareness I had of news while I was in Antarctica, even if I had some contact with the outside world. Um, sort of depressingly, a few of the men who made it back from Shackleton's voyage would die soon afterwards in the Great War. So that's a little bit depressing. Now, I mentioned that two ships went to Antarctica with Shackleton. The Endurance was trapped in the ice and the Aurora was the other trip. And the Ross Sea Island party was sent to establish supply depots for Shackleton's men. And although the ship survived, three men died and they, their goal, their, their achievements ended up being a bit moot because Shackleton and his men didn't actually make it across the Antarctic continent. The Ross party managed to put the food for them, but Shackleton never even reached land, so the depots were just never used. And the Aurora also got stuck in the ice off the shore. They drifted for six months and eventually had to depart to New Zealand because the ice destroyed their rudder. Um, they left out a small party behind to check out the depot, and they were not able to rescue the people who'd been left behind until 1917. And this part of the trip has largely been forgotten in many ways because the original purpose of the combined expedition, which was crossing the continent, just ended up completely falling by the wayside. The final voyage that's considered, that's considered to be part of the heroic age was kind of a melancholy coda. Shackleton was greatly in depth from his attempt across the continent, but he still desired adventure. He initially thought about going back to the Arctic but he turned his attention to the Antarctic again after a little bit. And he, he had hoped to have the Canadian government fund him to go to the Arctic, but they weren't as interested as he expected. So he hoped to circumnavigate the Antarctic continent and search for, search for new islands and possibly discover new resources along the way, like minerals and possibly seals also. And the Shackleton Rowett expedition of 1921 is often treated as the dividing line between the heroic age and the following mechanical age of Antarctic exploration, in which improved technology made the visits a lot safer. And on Shackleton's third expedition, his crew had a wireless set, they had heated lookouts in the ship, and they had something called an odograph, which was a device that would trace and chart the ship's route without them even putting any extra effort in. And Rowett was one of Shackleton's old school friends, and he was the one who funded this expedition. Shackleton headed out to South Georgia aboard a ship called the Quest, which was a small ship that had a lot of breakdowns. And it's not clear if it even could have made it to Antarctica safely. That kind of proves to be a moot point though, because Shackleton got sick when they were in Rio de Janeiro. He was noted as being subdued and listless during the voyage to South Georgia, and he died of a heart attack while they were waiting on South Georgia to prepare to head south. Shackleton is buried in the whaling station of Gritbegin, and his grave can still be visited. The quest would continue south, but they never got south of the ice, and in many ways this trip is known for Shackleton's death more than anything, and sort of symbolically considered to be the end of the heroic age. But I do have one more expedition to touch on from this time, actually from a bit earlier, from a bit earlier than the heroic age, but the first person to reach the North Pole was actually an African American man, um, Mr. Matthew Alexander Henson. And I mentioned before that some of the Antarctic voyages were brought about because people had wanted to reach the North Pole, but they had been beaten to it. And the expedition that beat them to the North Pole was headed by Robert Peary. And it's a bit of a nice contrast to the overall whiteness of Antarctic exploration that the first person to actually reach the North Pole as part of this expedition was Matthew Henson. And he was born to sharecroppers in Maryland, and he was working as a sales clerk in Washington, D.C. when Robert Peary met him. And the two of them became close, and Peary decided to bring him on board his expedition as a laborer. 
but by the time they actually got to the Arctic, he had begun to treat Hansen more as his first mate. Hansen was very quick to adapt to the cold and to the ins and outs of Arctic exploration, and he was very quick to adapt the skills of the Inuit guides they brought along. So Hansen, Peary, and some of their Inuit guides were part of the group that was actually actually set out to reach the North Pole. And Hansen was sent ahead as a scout and became the first person to reach the pole and to plant a flag there. He isn't a household name, but his achievement was quite remarkable, especially considering the degree to which Black Americans were excluded from science and from things like this. And I would not have even known he existed if it were not for a Stevie Wonder song. The Stevie Wonder song Black Man has this little history lesson style call and response section at the end and a bunch of children recite the names of his of important historical figures of color and one of one of the lines goes who was the first man to set foot on the north pole and the children go matthew hansen a black man so i'm very glad i came across that song because that taught me a little really interesting tidbit of polar exploration history that has kind of been neglected so we're not quite done with the human history of Antarctica. Um, we'll have one more lecture on the 20th century and the signing of the Antarctic Treaty and modern Antarctica. But the next big thing we'll cover next week is climate change. And we'll talk about how human actions have caused global climate change and how that has manifested in Antarctica. So enjoy the rest of your week. And I hope you found the history interesting. I realize it's a lot, but it's quite, I think it's quite interesting. So have a good weekend and I will see you next week.